now I'd like to play for you a piece by Beethoven. Now, I chose this piece because it has the same sort of repetitive feature. You'll hear it in the left hand. This is the bass part. It's like a clock ticking, you know? It reminds us of the movement, the passing of time, the value of time, filling it with good things. Beethoven calls this whole sonata, it has four movements. I'm just playing the second movement, but the pastoral. Why, what did he mean by pastoral? Well, Beethoven was so inspired by nature. He took time for nature every single day. He was a busy guy, okay? He was a busy guy and not feeling good most of his life. Yet, he found three hours every day to take walks outside. He connected with the good things. He listened. Uh, even when his hearing was gone, he listened internally to what God is telling him in nature. And then he wrote things down in a notebook he would carry on these walks. He would listen to the bird songs when he was younger, before he became deaf, and those would inspire him. He would create melodies based on the bird songs. Um, Thunder, the power of nature. He took walks no matter what kind of weather it was. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this pastoral, feeling the peace, the passing of time, the good things that Beethoven is trying to impart um, through his, the way he interprets nature in this piece.
This is how Beethoven had to hear. If he wanted to hear anybody's conversation, them talking to him, he would have to put a huge funnel like this, made of metal, look like a tuba, up to his ear and say, can you speak into here? Because I, I don't hear you. I can't hear you. So humiliating. And to think he was only barely 30 when his hearing started to deteriorate. By 32, he could barely hear anything. What to do next? Speak louder. He would tell people, I can't hear you. How could that be? The greatest composer, arguably, in history, at the cusp of the biggest success of his life, he's in Vienna, everybody is amazed by him, he's at the peak of his career, he has tons of commissions, he's the first freelancer who could decide what he wants to write and what not. He has patrons, he has fame, he has a attitude, he's like Prince, huh. No big deal. You're no big deal. There are a million princes that have come before you and after you, but there's only one Beethoven dude, and it's me. I mean, he had a healthy dose of confidence, right? Then hum totally humility sets in. Total humility. Speak up. I can't hear you. I'm deaf. The cruelest, cruelest joke. He felt it was the cruelest joke. From God, why did you do this to me? So he writes at age 32. He decides after going to the last doctor for treatment, the doctor says, there's nothing I could do. There's no hope. Your hearing is just going to get worse and worse until you can hear absolutely nothing. Beethoven decides to write his last will. He says, this is game over. I mean, how can I go on with my life? I can't be with people. Because of this, it's too humiliating. I can't perform anymore. I can't hear the music I write. Is there any point? Is there any point to any of this? So he writes the last will and testament. I want to show you some of the words he writes. He writes in this last will and testament, yet it was impossible for me to say to people, speak loud or shout, for I am death. He writes, how could I possibly admit an infirmity in the one sense which ought to be more perfect in me than others, a sense which I once possessed in the highest perfection, a perfection such as few in my profession enjoy or have enjoyed? Game over. Done. He decides to end his life. He's in the silence. It's like, God, cruel, cruel twist of fate. Why? 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 But we can often feel like that. We might not have that kind of infirmity that Beethoven had, but we can certainly relate to feeling in a really dark place and not having any sound. We can feel in the silence. So let's jump into a piece. Beethoven wrote a great Great, and I, all his music is great, but one of the greatest pieces he wrote in this particular time period was the Appassionata Sonata. Appassionata, it's so dramatic sounding, isn't it? What does it mean, a passion, passion, pathos? It's not just a love story, it's so much more than that. It's that revelation of in the turbulence, in my weakness, I am made strong. It has three movements. The outer two are the pressure cooker. We know that a diamond becomes a diamond through what? Pressure. So you feel the pressure of the outer movements. Today, I will perform for you the middle movement. It's the piece that surpasses all understanding. It is the eye in the midst of the storm of total calmness. And what it shows us is this question, answer. Just what we need to do in prayer. We need to ask and we need to listen. Asking the question and listening to the answer. Question response is one of the most basic elements of music. And let me show you how Beethoven uses it here. 
He starts with um, just simple chords. Again, Beethoven is about elements. You won't hear beautiful arias like Bellini or Verdi or Rossini uh, or even Chopin created. In Beethoven, you get the elements of nature. Beethoven's music is elemental. It is celestial. It is of the earth and of the heaven. So Beethoven uses these building blocks. Question, what's the answer to that? Here he gives us the answer. that he creates this beautiful movement where he gives us this theme with a whole bunch of variations that as they get further on you hear it it becomes really high up on the piano it sounds celestial in nature
Okay, here we go. I just want to point out that the opening of the sonata, it's like another language altogether. What is this? Is this a melody? It's like a, a snippet. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, not a full sentence. It's like ice cream truck. You know, it's something so, so completely random. And this, it's like drumming, right? How do you make one of the grandest sonatas of all time from fragments? What does he do next? More of the same. This snippet. Another time. Going up and down it. I'm exaggerating the tempo, but it's... Do you hear how abstract it is? It's not this. That's Chopin. That's melody. That's feeling. This? How do you explain this? It's like taking one of these huge seashells and listening in and hearing the universe speaking to you or looking through the Hubble telescope and seeing a world that we don't know yet. And I believe that Beethoven in his deafness was able to access this world in a different way. Um, in that inner silence, he heard things that we don't hear and saw things that we don't see. But he communicates things to us. Waldstein, just to give you a little background, so Beethoven wrote this piece between 1803 and 1804. And again, um, he was about 33, 34 years old, very young yet, but he was already entering clearly in his heroic middle period. Beethoven had three periods, which we designate for his writing style, the early the middle, which is known as the heroic period, and the late Beethoven, which is known as the really, you know, far out, more esoteric, um, more abstract kind of music that we are still, all of his music we are fascinated by because of how he did it. Again, he was so singular in the way that he used material. It's how does Beethoven do this, right? He uses such minimal elemental material and he creates an energetic structure. This, when I play this, it makes me feel like I'm dealing with a live bomb and it might detonate at any moment. It's just energy. That's pure energy. And that's what Beethoven is telling us here expand with this energy, expand your thinking, expand your horizons, expand those limitations because there are no limitations. There are no limitations. Only what we believe in our head, that's the only limitation.
a kind of outpouring of the heart, wouldn't you say?、Uh, there is this crying out, crying out, expressing all the pain, the suffering, the longing in the heart. Last week we talked a little bit about Chopin, and when he wrote the Preludes, he was very sick. He was already in advanced stages of the tuberculosis. He was staying in a monastery that was cold. It was supposed to be a vacation in Mallorca, Spain, which turned into a bit of a disaster because <laughs> you ever go on vacation and it rains all the time. You go to Florida and you're expecting sun and you're expecting to just you know soak up the rays, get some relaxation, be outside. And instead, it rains every day, and it's about sixty degrees. And you think, "Oh my gosh, that's not the vacation I was hoping for." Well, that was a little bit what happened with Chopin. It was supposed to be a time away, and it turned into a time of、uh, coldness, getting further into his sickness with the tuberculosis, and just a, a general time of malaise. And、um, isn't it amazing? In those times of malaise, in those times of difficulties, what often emerges,、uh, and it's difficult. But often, it's in those difficult times where we grow the most. And、um, so, in this prelude by Chopin,、uh, you could see, you could feel, you could feel the pain and the tension of this. He writes espressivo, like with all your expression, with all your heart, and then the rest are these shifting harmonies. And they're just like shifting shadows. Did you ever see the sun, and、uh, as it it moves ever so slightly? Or the wind blows in the breeze, and you see how the light reflects differently. Well, it's it's to me that's a picture of these harmonies, which shift ever so slightly. And I promised that we would talk a little bit about the subject of space between the notes because it relates to our life. Music is simply、uh, a way, a language of the heart, and our heart is never beating. Like a metronome or like a clock, it's always changing. It's always shifting. If you are running, obviously it's faster than when you are relaxing.、Uh, also, when we have difficult times, trauma,、um, agitation, our heart doesn't beat regularly anymore either. It does have a, a certain irregularity to it, and music as well. When it's played too regularly, it just lacks. Humanity, and it's in the space between the notes. Mozart said that the magic of music happens, and it's also in those spaces in our life, in those times where it seems like nothing is happening, that really, like Mozart said, the music is made. That really, the biggest shifts are made. So, just as an example, if I was to play the first few measures very evenly. Notice, you notice how it starts to sound like a, a march. It starts to really sound not human, and then it gets enlivened by the space between the notes. I, I remember as a child when I first got.、Uh, My first recording of Chopin's music, played by Arthur Rubinstein. It was a gift my piano teacher gave me, and I, I was listening on my record player. Of course, that dates me, but okay.、Uh, it was such a beautiful sound, and I thought, "Oh my gosh, is this even possible? How do you create such sound? It seemed like from heaven." From heaven, and certainly Chopin's music is music of dreams, music of the night, the mystery of the night. 
looking up at the stars, hearing the crickets, hearing um, some of those uh, rustlings in the night. You hear the mystery, the potential, and the possibility. So um, Chopin, when he wrote The Nocturnes, there were three elements that he wanted to focus on. Number one was the sense of melody. For instance, this nocturne, the first one in B flat minor starts. And so the melody is usually on the top part of the piano because Chopin was very interested in imitating the sound of the voice. So it's very operatic, like an aria, um, just pouring out your heart. That's what he was doing on the piano. And then the left hand, he was so clever. He devised these wonderful, what we call broken chords. Basically, it's this. But imagine if that was all there was in the bass. But he creates this web. There's so much connective tissue, connective tissue uh, supporting everything. So you have this incredible opportunity of expression. And then Chopin, third thing that he adds inner voices, um, melodies underneath other melodies. And of course, this is so complex, this music, but Chopin's quest was for simplicity. 